Good morning, everyone. It's so great to see you. Welcome to the 2020 Diversity Summit. The uh, Diversity Summit is a biennial, which early in the morning, that's every other year, uh, fall event where we reflect and we refocus on the efforts of creating, sustaining, and maintaining diversity, inclusion, and equity in the legal profession in Pennsylvania. My name is Andrea Farney, and I will be your host today. I'm a founding partner of Triketra Law, civil rights, employment law, and appellate advocacy-focused firm. I'm a course planner for today's summit, and just so you're aware, I'm here uh, virtually, of course, but physically, I'm in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. My understanding is that we have a very wonderful uh, turnout for today's session, maybe up to 160 people. And I know that uh, there are at least 22 counties represented, so we're very excited about that. Today's program is developed by the Pennsylvania Bar Association Minority Bar Committee in collaboration with the Montgomery Bar Association. Our theme this year is practical tips and tools for attorneys, law firms, and bar leaders. We have five sessions that we hope will engage and energize you with the programming running all day. Uh, but don't worry, we will have two breaks uh, and a lunch period off. The program ends at 445, but we uh, invite you to join us after the event for a virtual reception, which is co-sponsored by our own Pennsylvania Bar Association diversity team and the PBA Young Lawyers Division. The reception will start at 5 p.m. immediately following the program. And as the day goes along, we'll have some more specific information about how to join that. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Taisha Miley. She is chair of the Minority Bar Committee of the PBA. Ms. Miley is a civil litigation attorney with a regional transportation authority. She continues to provide pro bono legal services in the areas of family law, real estate, and estate planning. She received her Bachelor of Arts from Urban, or from urban, legal, and urban legal Studies from the City College of New York. That won't be the first time I mess up my script. Graduate, she graduated from Fordham University. In 2012, she was recognized as a rising star, which our PA lawyers and staff know that that means she's 2.5% of the cream of upcoming attorneys who are 40 years or younger and practicing less than 10 years. I'm not gonna do the math on her with 2012, so we'll guess her age, but we'll let that go. She was elected to the Regional Director of Region 3 of the National Bar Association in 2014. She's a member of the 2015-2016 PA Bar Association Leadership Institute. In 2017, she was recognized as the National Bar Association's 40 Under 40, and she became chair of the PBA Minority Bar Committee in 2019, and she continues to serve in that role. She's also a member of the House of Delegates. Taisha, welcome, and uh, it's my pleasure to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you for being a part of this, what we hope is a pertinent and timely programming. It is our goal to make sure that uh, you continue the conversation after today's program. I want to take this time to thank my co-vice chairs, uh, Tony Thompson and Anthony Cox. I want to also thank you all for continuing to spread the word about our program today amongst leagues and com committees. Thank you to the Diversity Summit uh, subcommittee, the co-chairs, Sharon Barney, Anthony Cox, Andrea Farney, Jay Silverblatt, and Patrice Tareen for putting together this robust and engaging programming for your intellectual consumption today along with action steps designed to create and enhance diversity, equity, and inclusion. A thank you to the Montgomery Bar Association that pivoted quickly when it became clear that this would not be able to be an in-person meeting. We want to thank our sponsors, our silver, silver level sponsors, McNeese, Wallace and Nurek, Stevens and Lee, and Triketra Law, of which Andrea Farney is a member. Our friend level sponsors are Eckert Siemens, JBM Legal, and Silverblatt Mermelstein, 
of which Jay Silverblatt is a member. Uh, please do remember to join us this evening for the uh, reception. Uh, so please don't leave. Obviously, there'll be a short break, but please join us for the reception. A lot of people worked hard putting these programs together as well as the reception. Uh, I think I want to spend a little time just briefly uh, touching on some of the things that are on our minds as we are within 30 days of the election. Uh, that there are continuing to be groups of people that are under attack in this country uh, that have historically and systematically been oppressed or repressed. One glance at the news or your social media feed make it evident that this country is in a state of violence that inundates our current reality. Equality is still not achieved, and that is why these diversity discussions are still very much needed. Diversity helps to reduce the otherness of being applied to so many people in this country. It's as if we cannot ever be considered true Americans. Yet the more we do together, the more we see one another as human beings. And that's why these conversations are important. Diversity is really about equality and humanity, the ability to be human and enjoy all that that entails. I watched an episode, and some of you may or may not know this show, of uh, the man in the high castle. And the premise of the show is to show an alternate world in which the Nazis won World War II. At some point during the episode, they referred to other human beings as useless eaters, literal parasites. It is our hope that with today's programming, we leave here making sure to bring up diversity and equality in every meeting, every outing, every room. Well, maybe not rooms because of COVID, but every time we encounter anyone anywhere, to ensure that people are, aren't viewed or referred to as useless eaters or parasites on society. Our work in the Minority Bar Committee is helping to remove those types of thoughts. We invite all of you, if you are not members, to join us uh, so that we can continue to break down thoughts like that and other thoughts that people may have of the otherness of other human beings. Uh, the activities that we've engaged in this year alone, this bar year, uh, which began in May, uh, is that we've been co-sponsoring conversations with the PBA diversity team on racism. If you've missed any of those uh, programs, they are available on the PBA website. I encourage everyone to send links to friends and family to view those. They have been eye-opening and astonishing in their content and their uh, production and delivery. We've also co-sponsored resolutions with the women in the profession make the minority and women uh, seats permanent on the Board of Governors. Those resolution, that resolution will be this November. We are co-sponsoring a resolution with the Civil and Equal Rights Committee to rename the Pennsylvania Justice Center after Chief Justice Nix, the father, not the son, the courthouse located in Harrisburg, not in Philadelphia. Uh, for those unfamiliar, uh, the, we also have subcommittees that are very active. Our newsletter committee just published Houston's Legacy, which is available now, the fall edition, and is available on our website. Uh, please check that out. Our legislative subcommittee is always monitoring and responding to legislation on the state, federal, and local levels. Our membership committee is engaging our executive council and membership, as well as growing our membership across the state. We are partnering in our community outreach subcommittee with local organizations to provide much uh, assistance as needed around the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Our listserv is a valuable resource. It is informative. There are referrals. There is an opportunity to gain potential clients through it. Um, and among our members, because sometimes people don't know, uh, are uh, past and present officers of this body. Uh, they include President Schwager, who I will have the privilege of introducing shortly, immediate past President John, past President Sharon Lopez, uh, President-elect Wilkerson, Vice President Silverblatt. And our members are also recognized uh, through the legal community, as recently the legal intelligencer has named Adalu Bakari, Rafael Castro, and Melissa Martinez as the Legal Intelligencer's 2020 Legal Excellence Award recipients. Congratulations to all of them. I encourage additionally everyone to make sure that their loved ones have a plan to vote and you help them vote safely if they're voting in person. I, it is my pleasure to introduce President Schrager who is a partner with the firm of Sharrington, Schwager and Malik. He specializes in real estate. And uh, one of his uh, key 
contributions to our efforts in diversity is that uh, as the chair of the Pennsylvania Disciplinary Board, he uh, spearheaded an initiative to collect aggregate lawyer data on race and demographics to provide a baseline for racial, sex, and age uh, of the lawyers in Pennsylvania. He asked me to keep it short, so I'm gonna turn it over to him now. Thank you so much, President Swinger. Thank you so much, Taisha, and thanks so much for that kind introduction, and thanks for keeping it short. Um, we have so many great things to get on with today, so I'm not going to take up much of your time, but I want to thank all of you for participating. I think this is a, a tremendous uh, turnout today for what will prove to be a very worthwhile uh, experience for all of us. Um, diversity and inclusion has been and remains uh, one of the keystones of the Pennsylvania Bar Association, and we are committed to continuing to advance those beliefs and those goals as we go forward together, uh, particularly during some of these very turbulent and troubling times. Um, but again, thank you so much for having me with you, and you'll hear a lot more from me this afternoon uh, with uh, Chief Judge Juan Sanchez of the Eastern District. But thank you so much, Taisha. And I'll pick it up from here. Thank you, President Schwager. Uh, we appreciate your leadership. Uh, hashtag rise of Schwager. Uh, this year's summit has a few noteworthy firsts. Uh, one first was to plan and offer the summit in collaboration with a local bar association. And the Montgomery Bar Association, we found not just willingness to work with us, but also dedication and enthusiasm on working jointly to produce the summit. Before we move into our first session, I'd just like to recognize Montgomery Bar Association President Patrick Curtis to give us a brief welcome. Uh, he is a partner in a small firm, Prince and Curtis, located in Pottstown. He handles a wide range of legal matters, including criminal, civil, juvenile, family, and orphans court matters. He uh, received his law degree from Villanova, so I wanted to put that out there so you can all chat that up for you Villanova alums, and a BA from Ursinus College, which I hope I uh, pronounced correctly. He is serving in the PA, uh, PBA House of Delegates since 2015. President Curtis, thank you so much for your involvement and I'll turn it over to you right now. Thank you so very much, Andrea, and good morning to our colleagues from around the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and welcome to the Pennsylvania Bar Association Statewide Diversity Summit. As, as Andrea said, my name is Patrick Curtis and I am I have the great privilege of serving as president of the Montgomery Bar Association. In 2007, the Montgomery Bar Association first convened a diversity task force to consider what our Bar Association could do to play a more active role in supporting the causes of diversity, equality, and inclusion. And the diversity committee became a standing committee of our Bar Association in 2008. The very next year, we initiated our 1L diversity program, which just celebrated its 12th year in existence. Over that time, we provided the opportunity for over 100 1L students of a diverse background to intern at a law firm in Montgomery County, while also getting the chance to see what our Bar Association is all about. While our efforts have evolved over those years and our commitment to diversity, equality, and inclusion has grown stronger, it is abundantly clear that there is still, and there may always be, more work to be done in these areas. The Montgomery Bar Association is truly honored to have been asked by the PBA to partner with them for this tremendous program and to play a prominent role in today's presentations. We're looking forward to a great day, and we sincerely thank you for committing a full day out of your schedule to provide your perspective and your input on these important issues. So, Without further ado, I'm, I'm pleased to turn it back over to the program facilitators and let's get going on the day's events. All right, thank you, President Curtis. That was a great setup for the kickoff. Our first session is developing skills to become an ally, awareness, willingness, values, and action. Uh, this, The moderator for this first session is Carl Cooper. Uh, Mr. Cooper is the country's first chief diversity officer of a Fortune 500 firm, Kilpatrick, Lockhart, and Gates. 
he is he has what I would call an illustrious career uh, and seriously on the word illustrious. Uh, he's been a city attorney, a law professor, including at Pitt, uh, a general counsel to the Pittsburgh Housing Authority. Uh, he's also been so active in the Bar Association. He's a former member of the Minority Bar Committee, former chair of the Minority Bar Committee, former member of the PBA Board of Governors, and a lifetime member of the Bar Association. In uh, Bar Foundation, excuse me. In 2015, Carl Cooper received the A. Leon Higginbotham Jr. Lifetime Achievement Award uh, from the PBA, which is a huge honor, very well deserved. Interestingly, uh, Carl Cooper, along with Sam Cooper, no relation, initiated the first diversity summit, uh, which was in two, 2006. And now 14 years later, uh, Mr. Carl Cooper is hosting or part of the first virtual diversity summit, which I think is, is really neat. We're very fortunate. He also uh, spends time working with middle school children uh, and at two charter schools in Pittsburgh. Uh, and these two charter schools are for those, we have a number of people from the West, uh, Manchester Academic Charter School and also uh, the Catalyst Academy Charter School. Thank you, Carl, for kicking off the first diversity summit for sure. And thank you for being here 14 years later to kick off our virtual diversity summit. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, and I'm glad to be here 14 years later. Uh, good morning to everyone. My name is Carl Cooper, and I'm going to introduce you to the subject of this morning's presentation about race, racism, and the legal profession. We've entitled this session, Developing Skills to Become an Ally, Awareness, Willingness, Values, and Action. I was asked to participate in this session of the program because of my background in diversity. Some years ago, I was asked to be the Chief Diversity Officer of KNL Gates Law Firm headquartered in Pittsburgh. As one of the country's first executive officers in the role of a management level uh, chief diversity officer, I had to develop the goals and the responsibilities of this newly created position. And the first thing I did was to define diversity. D uh, diversity, it means differences. Differences in this context, in terms of race. Talking about race is difficult. Talking about race is complex because we as a nation have tried to pretend that race doesn't matter, but race matters. As Professor Cornell West aptly made clear in his seminal book entitled Race Matters, race matters more now than at almost any other period of our history outside of the Civil War and the drafting of the Constitution. Race mattered in the drafting of the Constitution because it determined representation and representation mattered because it determined who would govern this new democracy. It is noteworthy that 35 of the 55 delegates to the Constitutional Convention were lawyers or men who had legal training. And of course, all of the delegates were white men. Ironically, they crafted a constitutional document which began with the words, we, the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union. They then excluded from this more perfect union, women, Native Americans, and included slaves, Blacks, as three fifths of a person for representation purposes only. So this new government began with words of inclusion and immediately excluded everyone except white men and it was created by lawyers who said they wanted to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty, but just for themselves. Recent events demonstrate that in over 400 years, we the people still have not attained a more perfect union. 
we still cannot admit or agree that race matters and that structural racism is at the core of our constitutional democracy. Late in the 19th century, the Supreme Court of this country determined that Native Americans had no rights, which the white man had to honor or to respect. And in that same century, the same Supreme Court determined that a slave named Dred Scott had no legal rights. Over the centuries, lawyers have fought for and against the reality that race matters. The legal system has tortured itself to find ways to remedy past injustices without admitting past wrongs and injustices. Constitutional amendments, civil rights laws have all attempted to ameliorate structural racism and inequities, but they have always fallen far short of the mark. Indeed, we still can't talk about race without feeling uncomfortable. We're being asked not to talk about white privilege or slavery, but to teach our children our true history from 1619 to the present, or we'll suffer federal punishment in the form of being denied federal dollars. As lawyers, we played a significant role in creating this situation for ourselves and our posterity. And we have failed to bend the moral arc of the universe in the right direction. And as Spike Lee said, we need to do the right thing. We hope through this program, we can work together to identify the problems, promote solutions, and most importantly, take action, both on an individual and from an institutional position. With that, I'd like to turn the program over to my colleagues and faculty, Ellen Ostro, John Cantor, Patrice Turin, Evelyn Devine, and Jay Silverblatt. Hope you enjoy the program. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. This is uh, Jonathan Cantor. And I want to start by just saying how great it is to join all of you in Pennsylvania from uh, my chair here in Seattle, Washington. And you may uh, be able to notice the sunrise in the window outside me as we go through this event. We're going to be spending the next just about two hours with all of you. And Ellen Ostro and I are going to start it off with um, uh, sort of a, we're going to front load the presentation with some slides and some information, and then we're going to open it up and do some exercises uh, with you all. So let me now transfer to my slides here and uh, get it started. Jonathan? Yes, Ellen. I'm just going to interrupt uh, and invite participants uh, in today's summit to uh, let us know if you have questions um, or comments by uh, writing something in the chat and I will be monitoring that and periodically we will do our best to respond to your questions. Thank you, Ellen. Ellen and I have had the good fortune to work with a wonderful team of people on developing this presentation. And it's quite honestly been a profound and moving experience to work with all of you on developing this. And we will introduce the different members of the team as their roles uh, show up at different points in our presentation. But for now, I just wanted to acknowledge that it's been quite an experience. Now, none of you know who I am. So I will say real briefly, I am at the University of Washington here. I'm a, I'm a psychologist, even though I prefer to refer to myself as a behavioral scientist. And I've been working very closely with the University of Washington Medical Center on their health equity efforts over the last several years, doing trainings throughout the medical system here and in other medical centers. And I've also been working very closely with legal organizations. We've done variations on the training that we will present to you today, for example, with the um, Washington State Attorney General's Office, and just to make sure we were being equitable also with the uh, public defenders groups as well. Um, 
and uh, other law schools in the area and uh, around the country. And so we're presenting sort of a variation on this work that we've been doing in different guises and different ways. And it is called uh, Awareness, Willingness, Values and Action, Developing Skills to Become Allies. And we will just launch into it right now and explain as we go. So uh, Taisha started us off with a great introduction to put this work in the current context, what's going on in our world right now. And I would just like to acknowledge that we started working with Carl and developing this presentation before the COVID crisis hit. We were planning on coming to do this to you live. And then of course, before the murder of George Floyd and Ahmed Arbery and Breonna Taylor and Jacob Blake and others that have really created this upheaval and surge of interest in the work. And since George Floyd, I will tell you all that Ellen and I and the group have felt that it is important to challenge everybody even more strongly and more directly than we were initially planning to. And this is a picture here of the protest, Black Lives Matter protest after George Floyd's murder in Philadelphia. And so if you look closely, I think you can see Carl there on the left and you can see Jay in the crowd on the right. And I suspect uh, several of, several, I'm just kidding. And I suspect uh, several others may have been in attendance at this very large protest. And there was the surge of interest in this work right after George Floyd. And the reality is, since the surge of interest, things have been going back to baseline. There's always this difficulty sustaining action. And our assumption in this work with all of you is that you're all wanting to move the needle to become more anti-racist. You're all wanting to move the needle to achieve more racial justice in the legal profession, to decrease prejudice and discrimination in the legal profession. We're assuming that is the goal and the intention of all of you, but there are obstacles. It is hard to do so. And so we are hoping to address some of those obstacles and really help people move in the right directions to achieve what Taisha said in the introduction, uh, a commitment such that in every space you enter, in every room you enter, diversity, equity, and inclusion will be the focus. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ellen for a few minutes here for the next few slides. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Ellen Ostro, and I'm uh, sitting in my living room in Silver Spring, Maryland, um, which is right outside uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, I am a psychologist and uh, an executive coach, and for the past 22 years have been working ex exclusively with lawyers and law firms on helping uh, women and attorneys of color advance in the profession. And I had the great honor of working with Carl Cooper um, about seven or eight years ago uh, to transform a Washington DC law firm into from one that had one black lawyer, the only people of color other than that one lawyer were uh, the staff into one of the most prominent and uh, publicized diverse law firms in the country. So uh, I have a debt of gratitude to pay to Carl um, to my dying day. We wanted to just give you some numbers to orient you. In, not, in 2010, the ABA did a survey uh, of the percentage of lawyers in all settings at that time in the United States. And as you can see, there were 5%. Now, 10 years later, what would you guess would be the percentage? Now that you have that number in your mind, can you show us? Thank you. Uh, after all of the comments that we've heard this morning to orient us to the importance of this work, maybe this doesn't surprise you. The needle has not moved. Ne next one, thank you. 
And, and we just wanted to give you some sense of what happens in the careers of black attorneys in law firms. So this data comes from the 2019 Vault uh, Minority Corporate Council Association survey. And as you can see, while law students enter the profession in small but significant numbers, over the course of their careers, they are no longer in firms. And for me, perhaps the most disturbing number is looking at the percentage of equity partners and seeing that while many women, many black women enter the profession, that not only do they leave, but that they are essentially invisible as equity partners in most law firms. So uh, I hope these numbers add to the call to action that we are trying to sing today. Um, I also wanted to make another important point. You know, we know we're speaking to an audience of both white attorneys and attorneys of color. And what we don't want to do is to alienate white attorneys by eliciting defensiveness. So you're going to hear us use words like race, racism, racist, anti-racist. And I don't want you shutting down your computers and turning off your Zoom. So that's why I have this slide here. Um, we are not here to talk to you about um, racism that is motivated by uh, malice and hatred uh, and takes the form of a de deliberate intentional actions. There are, uh, there's a, a binary view of racism in this country. Um, what we think of too often is when we think of racists are, for example, the people in Charlottesville, those good people. Uh, as the president said. And since you don't identify with those people, when you hear the word racist, you think, well, that's those people, that's not me. And what we hope you will learn today is that that's not, that, that is a very extreme and overt form of racism. And that the kind of racism we're talking about today occurs without conscious awareness or intent. So I consider myself to be racist too often. I grew up in this country and I've uh, learned the culture and become a part of it. And that doesn't mean that I can't be engaged in anti-racist work. And that's what we hope you will begin to do if you haven't already. So I'm going to spend about 10 or 15 minutes setting the foundation for the rest of the workshop. And I'm going to go through these slides, hopefully at a fairly steady clip. And as I do so, as Ellen said earlier, please put comments or questions in the chat and Ellen will be monitoring the chat as I go through the slides and perhaps interrupt me once or twice with a relevant comment or question. So as Ellen, said, we're going to start with this idea of anti-racism. And for those of you who are not familiar, Ibram Kendi has written this book that is a New York Times bestseller right now called How to Be an Anti-Racist. And he has sort of changed the definition of racism and anti-racism in a significant way. And what he says is that the good news is that racist and anti-racist are not fixed identities. In other words, we can be racist one minute and anti-racist the next. And I think a simple way to understand this changed definition is that it really focuses on behavior, not people. It focuses on what people are doing and what they're thinking versus it just being a description of the character of a person. 
And so the question Ibram Kendi wants you, wants all of us to ask ourselves is what is our behavior right now? Would we label our behavior right now racist or anti-racist? And Kendi also wants us to ask ourselves, what place am I most passionate about reforming? And then becoming part of the struggle to challenge racist policies in that place. And so here we are at the Pennsylvania Bar Association. And so we can work under the assumption that the place you're all passionate about reforming at the moment is the legal profession in Pennsylvania and in your organizations. And then how do we engage in continuous anti-racist action to move the needle and make things better. And that's where the struggle shows up because it's difficult to sustain this work over time. And while we're focusing on changing policy and procedures and practices that's so important, anti-racism work must also be psychological. In order to be successful at the policy change, we must focus on the psychological. What do I mean by psychological? I mean what Ellen was talking about just a minute ago subtle biases that we may or may not be aware of in our decision-making, the way biases and stereotypes show up in our everyday interpersonal interactions, and all the other obstacles that get in the way of anti-racist action, passivity, inaction, defensiveness is a big one we're gonna to get to in a few minutes, denial, and probably the most important one is just simply anxiety. There's a lot of threat associated with doing this work, with getting out in front of it, and we have to confront that anxiety directly. So one example of what I mean by the psychological work, this is Tahira Amutu Wadud, a lawyer in Massachusetts who actually ran for legislature there. And in some of the news articles that she was featured in, she told her own history. And here's just one quote from her about her history as a lawyer. She says, some of my clients know who I am. In other words, they know I'm a Muslim um, or they'll Google me. So they're not shocked when they see me. I used to say to them, this is what I look like. This is what I dress like. So, you know, when you come upstairs, I just wanted them to know. She goes on to describe, I have a client who is a white man who told me recently, and we go back five years. When I first came to your office, I wanted to leave. I said, she's not the one for me. But then importantly, he sat down and we talked about his case and he got comfortable. And I want to hold up this unknown white man here who was interacting with Tahira as an example of what we're talking about. He had these reactions to her, he, which we'll talk through in a moment, but he stayed, he didn't leave. And by staying, he became anti-racist in that moment and over time. Okay. So we're gonna to talk to you about four psychological processes that lead to these sorts of subtle biases that we can call microaggressions and we can call implicit bias. And all four of these psychological processes are based on a, an abundance of scientific evidence. I'm not going to give you the evidence today. I'm just gonna talk you through the processes in ways that hopefully help you connect with them in your bodies. By microaggressions, if you haven't heard that term before, we're talking about all of the racial snubs, insults, offenses, subtle things that happen in everyday interactions that land on black and brown and other people of color as racially offensive. Um, and by implicit bias, we're talking about all of the biases that affect decision-making. So in the legal profession, we're talking about hiring, evaluation, promotion, lots of other decisions that occur outside of our awareness. And I'm gonna to talk to you about these processes. The first one is objectifying. I'll get to that in a second. Biases in what we notice about others. Stereotypes, which we're all familiar with. Biases in our thoughts and thought processes. And then again, anxiety or biases in what we feel. Now, I said four psychological processes. You'll notice there are only three here. I'm saving the fourth for later. I'll get to that in a few minutes. But now I'm gonna go through these first three. And as I go through these first three, the goal is for you to try to notice these processes in your own interactions. Notice how this may show up for you. And this actually applies to white people, but it also applies to all people. Everyone, when they're interacting with people who are different from them, 
are liable to have these processes occurring in their own bodies. Now, when a white person, for example, is interacting with a black person, one of the first things that happens is you notice the differences. There is an abundance of research showing that when a white person is interacting with a black person, their attention will get hooked by the stereotypical features of the black person's face, the nose, the lips, and so forth, rather than, most importantly, going directly to eye contact, which what would happen if a white person is interacting with another white person. And without that immediate eye contact or with those deficits in eye contact, lots of problems occur. Eye contact is how we read each other's emotions, for example. So the first process I wanna orient people to is this process called objectifying. And this is simply when this hooking of our attention happens, and then we express that we've been hooked in this way, and this actually lands on people as a microaggression. And so one of the classic microaggressions, which you may or may not have heard of, I'm just putting this out there because many people have heard of it, is you see this black woman, you get hooked by her hair, and you say, can I touch your hair? We're gonna call that an objectifying microaggression. Or you're maybe interviewing this Asian woman for a position in your firm, and you ask her, where are you from? Now, where are you from is a normal thing to ask people. Um, but when she says, oh, I'm from Pittsburgh or wherever she may be from, you've been hooked by her Asian features. Pittsburgh does not meet your brain's need for an Asian themed response. And so then you say, no, I mean, where are you really from? Because you need more of an Asian themed response. And that's when you are really objectifying her. Um, or in this case, we have a, um, a partner interacting with a new associate and he says, oh, hi, Marcus. And Marcus has to say, oh, I'm Mike. Marcus is the other black guy here. Now, what's happened for this partner is he has engaged in this process of objectifying beyond his awareness because of these differences that happen. He simply hasn't been able to individuate Marcus and Mike as well as he could because he's not noticing the individual features, he's just noticing the stereotypical features. And this happens over and over again for black people. So as I'm going through this process, I'm hoping you can play with the idea of how this shows up in your own interactions and your own bodies. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on the second process of expressing stereotypes because we all know what stereotypes are. I'm only here to say this happens. It happens in everyday interactions. We may or may not be aware of the stereotypes that pop in our minds when we're having these interactions, but they unfortunately do. When we see this kid, we all immediately can recognize the stereotypes that I'm talking about here. I don't even have to name them. When we're interacting with this young black female associate, you may have stereotypes pop in your head and express them. You may say, oh, she's gonna make trouble and not fit in. She's gonna be a quote, angry black woman. Um, or she's quite articulate um, expressing stereotypes that you weren't expecting her to, to be so articulate. Um, or she probably got into law school through affirmative action. Now we're talking about something more explicit and damaging. Um, or perhaps you're having a meeting talking about the possibility of hiring this Asian woman I mentioned before. And in the meeting, you say, she's not going to make it as a litigator. She's just too soft spoken, expressing stereotypes about women and Asian women in particular. So those two processes, objectifying and stereotypes, they happen automatically in our bodies. They're gonna be different for different people depending on your history, your development, your experiences. But for most of us, they unfortunately happen in our bodies, whether we're aware of it or not. The last process I wanna talk about real quickly that happens in our bodies is this anxiety process. And again, going back to this, to this kid without knowing anything else about him. Uh, for many white people, unfortunately, because of inaccurate stereotypes and other processes, you're gonna get some threat response into, in response to this kid. Um, in response to this woman who I mentioned before, you may also have some anxiety show up. Um, consider this possibility. 
consider the possibility that you're interviewing her for a position and she says the following to you during an interview. At my last firm, they were making jokes about Worms Lives Matter and spread the rumor that I only got into Harvard through affirmative action. Now, to be clear, it's very, very unlikely this woman would actually say this to you. These kinds of conversations, unfortunately, do not happen in law firms. At least they do not happen across racial differences. This woman, I'm sure, would be more likely to be sharing this with her black colleagues quite freely, but she's not gonna be sharing this with her white colleagues because she doesn't feel safe to do so. And the reason she doesn't feel safe to do so is because of how people respond when she does share this. So again, consider that she's just said this to you. How would you respond? Now I can tell you from research my center has done with medical students, transferring that research to what I think it would sound like for lawyers, a typical response is something like this. Wow, that sounds really unpleasant. We'll make sure that kind of stuff doesn't happen here. Let's get back to the interview. Now, some of you may be having a response here that that response isn't really that bad, but I can tell you from her perspective, she's saying this person's uncomfortable with what I just said. She's not feeling satisfied with the response. She's probably feeling a little invalidated and she's recognizing that you're uncomfortable and anxious in response. Now, people have lots of comments and discussion about this. We don't have time to get into it right now, but we might have time to go back to this example later. For now, just one more example of this. Back to the interview um, where uh, these issues come up, you may express anxiety and avoidance simply by avoiding discussing race and racism altogether. Now, if you think about it, that may be happening for all of you right now as I'm giving this presentation and you're thinking about what comes next. Some of you may be just thinking, I better, I better be quiet, not say anything wrong. And uh, that's an understandable strategy, but I'm here to tell you it's unfortunately not a growth strategy and it lands on people of color as a problem. John, so, John, yes, I'm Ellen. I'm gonna interrupt for one second. Um, there's a discussion in the chat about um, the wish for more attention to um, defense or corporate counsel. Um, and I just wanna make clear that if you hear us saying law firm, it's probably because our colleagues in this presentation work in law firms. Um, but we're not saying that these processes or these kinds of incidents only occur in law firms. In fact, they do occur in every kind of workplace that lawyers work in, in Pennsylvania and across the country. And so um, no uh, offense for not being explicit about corporate counsel. I'm sorry that we have neglected to mention you. Um, we know there are many of you out there. Yes, thank you. I agree completely. My examples do uh, prioritize law firms and not corporate counsel. Um, it's noted. Um, okay, so those were that was a quick review of these three processes. I told you there was a fourth one that I was saving for later. I want to get to that now. This fourth process is potentially where even more of the harm occurs, and so I wanted to separate it from the others. When all of this happens, when objectifying stereotypes and anxiety happen, we have to decide what to do in response to this. Um, okay, I apologize, a little out of order with my slides. I'm going to just uh, skip the slide for now and um, go back to what I was saying before. We have to decide what to do in response to these processes. And the fourth process is what I'm simply going to call def denial and defensiveness. And this is where we uh, really struggle, many of us, and we wanna try to help people with that. So here are some examples. Uh, back to this response to this woman. Well, that sounds really unpleasant. We'll make sure that kind of stuff doesn't happen here. Earlier, I described it as an example of anxiety, um, but it's also an example of denial. 
that sounds really unpleasant. Her story, if you remember the example, was actually fairly racist. Um, that sounds really unpleasant is, uh, is, um, is, is probably lands on her as minimizing the extent of her story. We want to help people be more blunt with acknowledging race and racism rather than these sort of subtle acts of denial. When we talk about colorblindness, uh, that's also an example of denial and defensiveness. You may say to her, when I look at you, I don't see color. And you may think that's actually trying to be helpful but I uh, unfortunately have to be the bearer of bad news. It, it probably lands on her as unhelpful and microaggressive. Um, back to this example, the guy you called Mike uh, Marcus. You might say, oh, I assure you it's not racial. I always mix up people's names. And the difficulty there is the, the bias is subtle and it's hard to notice the difference. Um, and this may come out as a genuine defensive reaction. Um, or back to this example of interviewing this woman, um, you may respond, well, when I told her she wouldn't make it as a litigator because she's too soft-spoken, it's because she's too soft-spoken. I'm not being biased here. She's really soft-spoken. So these are the natural responses that show up. And then we want to help people with them because they get in the way of anti-racist action. So here's what we're going to do for the rest of today, with these four processes in mind, objectifying, stereotypes, anxiety, and denial and defensiveness, we want to help you work with them. And we're going to lean into this idea of mindfulness, which has dozens of scientific studies in support of its benefits for anti-racist action. And we're going to walk you through these four processes, awareness, willingness, values, and action. And we're going to get to awareness and willingness in a second, uh, but just real quickly on values and action. When we say values and action, I'm talking about what is important to you in life? What values do you profess? And then how do you align your behavior with those values and sustain that behavior over time? So just two notable examples, the man facing down the tank in Tiananmen Square, a great inspirational example of values in action. And then Christian Cooper, who for me and many others was really an inspiration for being able to stay composed and guided by values when he was responding to Amy Cooper in Central Park, um, threatening to call the police on him in response to him asking her to uh, collar up her dog. So these are just some examples of values in action. And Finally, we think these ideas of mindfulness and values and action can help black protesters. This is an, uh, a picture of black protesters in Brooklyn, New York, dealing with the fatigue, the exhaustion, what we can call racial battle fatigue, what we can call racial trauma. How do you deal with all of these feelings in your body and keep going day after day? And we also hope values and action can help white people these are pictures of white protesters in Seattle, Washington. How do you sustain valued action and anti-racist action over time? I'm going to lead us all through a mindfulness exercise right now. And it's actually going to respond to Patrice's testimony. Um, but the first part of the exercise will be a little different and then I'm going to bring Patrice's testimony back in. And to, to be clear, I, I was nervous about doing this. Um, I've done this exercise many times, but I've never done it with the person like Patrice as part of it. And so I just want to be clear that we, we talked this through um, and, uh, and hopefully it all will make, <laughs> and hopefully it all will make sense, but just recognizing that there's, there's a certain awkwardness about doing this, exercise about what Patrice just said with Patrice in, in the room. Um, just wanted to, to acknowledge that. So Ellen and I are psychologists. You're now seeing how we treat this psychologically. We're having a conversation in front of a group of lawyers that's probably different than what typically happens in diversity trainings. And this exercise is also going to be different. We're going to lean into what I said before, this idea 
of mindfulness. And Ellen just raised the, the term willingness. And that's a perfect word to enter into this exercise. As many of us are listening to Patrice's testimony, we're probably feeling a lot in our bodies, at least some of us are. Those feelings for many of us become obstacles. Those feelings are unpleasant. And the easiest thing to do with these feelings is to just try to suppress them, push them away, minimize them, don't pay attention to them. And we're going to suggest a different approach with this. It's about leaning into the feelings in the service of increasing your capacity to fully engage in anti-racist action. So with that, I will let you all know that you have choice. You don't have to do this. Choice is important. I'm going to lead you through a, a meditation and I'm going to get started now. And again, the first part is not going to be about Patrice. And then I'm going to bring Patrice in. The first part is going to ask you to consider some things that also may make you feel bad in your bodies. Um, it's going to be asking you to consider some difficult stuff. So you have choice as we do this. You have choice how much you want to participate. So... Okay, this will take about five minutes to walk through this now. I wanna ask you all to settle into your chairs, get comfortable as you can. You can even choose to close your eyes if you would like, but you don't have to, it's your choice. Okay, as you're settling in, simple breathing, gently follow the experience of your breath for a moment. Let your attention settle on your breath. Just notice how your body feels right now. I'm going to ask you to contemplate something for a few minutes. It may not be an easy thing to contemplate and it may make you feel sad or angry or upset or something else that you might not expect right now sitting in a room listening to a diversity workshop. You can of course choose not to do this. I wanna ask you to contemplate the idea that there are some things in all of our lives that are very hard to think about. Things we just don't want to think about. They're too unpleasant. Maybe a friend or a family member is struggling with an addiction and is not going to get better. Maybe that promotion that you wanted so badly isn't going to happen. That thing that was going to change your life it's not going to change. Maybe that's true. Maybe there's something you desperately want to happen, but it never will. Maybe there's something you desperately don't want to happen, and it will. These are things we usually avoid feeling and thinking about. I'm inviting you to let these feelings in. Again, with choice, you don't have to. Maybe you or a loved one is sick or scared you may not get to live as long as you want. I'm asking us to consider something very difficult that sometimes really bad, horrible, unacceptable things happen in life. We all have these things that happen in our lives. This is part actually of what makes us human. If you're willing, imagine one of these things right now, let it in, don't push it away. Consider the possibility that this thing you don't want to imagine has happened. And maybe life will not work out the way you hoped, the way you dreamed. And maybe with this thing you're imagining, life is fundamentally unfair. I know this is hard. If you're following me, my encouragement is to breathe. If it's too painful, you can bail out. If you're following me, my encouragement is to breathe. See if you can hold on to this feeling for a moment. You, you don't have to push it away. Can you expand with acceptance? Allow this feeling in your body, this feeling that this unthinkable, horribly unfair thing can happen. We have capacity to feel this. We don't have to push it away. We're strong enough to have these feelings and everything that comes with it. This is what it means to be human.
just a few breaths. I would like to now return to Patrice's testimony and lovingly bring Patrice back into our awareness. I would like you all to consider how similar you may be to Patrice, even in ways you don't expect. You may be a person of color, a black person like Patrice, and you know all too well the experiences of discrimination and racism that she reported. You may be a white person, and despite not knowing what it's like to be treated in the way she described, you have some similarities. You know what it's like to be rejected. You do. It's not the same, but there's something there that's similar. You know what it's like to be dismissed. We all with Patrice share a desire to make a difference in this world. We all have hopes and dreams about life. We care deeply about our families, our friends. We share this with Patrice. What if Patrice's experience that she just recounted, the details of it, the use of the N-word when she's a child, being accused of stealing her mother's Mother's Day gift, being told over and over again that she's not good enough, that she's other. Thinking being attorney would fix it, but then realizing it won't. This not belonging, being ignored, the jokes about colored, all the indignities. <sighs> what if that experience for you, for at least some white people in this group, is one of those things that's really hard to feel. What if at a fundamental level, Patrice's experience has been so unfair and so unlikely to be fixed that it's physically uncomfortable for some of us to let us believe it, to really feel it. What if her experience is as bad as the thing you don't want to believe about your life? What if there's a similarity there? We want to believe the world is fair, but what if it already exists for Patrice and others? The world is not fair. What if your task right now is to open up to the unfairness, to let it in so we can act on it? Finally, what if she isn't sure she can tell you these things because she isn't sure if you will believe her, but consider this, it's all true. It's all true. It's the kind of truth that's hard to have in your body. What do you notice in your body as we end this? Do you notice an urge to push it away? Do you notice a feeling that maybe some of what Patrice said is true, but some of it maybe is an exaggeration? Maybe at some point she's being too sensitive. Do you notice those obstacles to fully believing her? I want everyone to breathe, breathe those obstacles through so you can fully believe. A few more gentle breaths, and if you had your eyes closed, you can, you can open your eyes. If you'd like to share some comments in the chat, we will share a few of those. This exercise often brings people into a, a very quiet 
emotional space where you might not have a lot to share. If that's what you're feeling, that's understandable. There is one person who has thanked you and said it was very necessary. Very necessary. Um, someone else is saying that it was an amazing meditation because it showed us that we are capable of holding on to the uncomfortable feelings. That's so important to recognize that you really are strong enough to feel this. There's a lot of talk about how white people shouldn't prioritize their feelings in these spaces. And the reason is because the feelings can be a distraction from the work. But here we're allowing the feelings in order to not be distracted by them so we can do the work. I know some of you may be upset by this and recognizing there are a lot of emotions in the room that you weren't expecting. So I just wanna have grace around that. I also wanna give Patrice an opportunity to share any reactions you're having to having now been the focus of this. You don't have to Patrice, but just inviting you if there's more you want to say at this point. Okay, she's shaking her head now, thank you. Um, I also don't have any expectation, uh, but Carl, I know you're a part of this. Is there anything you want to add? And again, feel free to say no. The only thing I was thinking is that when I was first asked to um, work with Jay on this program, my immediate response was I, I, I'm exhausted. I don't want to do any more work in the field of diversity, uh, but I'm glad that I thought it through and decided to come back. And, this is the last time, though. like Michael Jackson said, this is it. I just, I can't, I really am, I'm exhausted. I can't do this work anymore. I've been doing it for 40 years. Our hope is that Today will be a, a sequence of passing 40 torches to new people to keep it going for you, Carl. I, I wanna read one comment because I, um, I think it's important. Uh, I feel optimistic knowing we can individually and collectively make things better through our awareness. And, and I, I wanna say how grateful I am to hear that at least one person is feeling optimistic. And also to point out that awareness is just the beginning, um, awareness and willingness, and then values and most importantly, taking action. And Carl, nobody wants you to leave. Uh, as we as we transition to the next phase of our work with Ellen taking the lead from here on out, um, I would just like to add that so often in this diversity work, too often black people, brown people, other people of color are burdened with having to tell their stories, having to do this heavy. People grow and other people grow. And just recognizing that uh, this is difficult stuff that uh, Patrice just did and uh, wanting to recognize that it often goes poorly for people um, when they share their stories. And the reason it goes poorly is because again, of how people respond. Um, and so my commitment to Carl, you, and to you, Patrice, is to, is to do everything I can to 
have this be a good experience for you, not just in this moment, but afterwards too. Okay. Ellen. Thank you, Jonathan. It's a hard uh, transition to make because we're all feeling so much right now. But since we only have an hour left, um, I'm going to transition us into the second and third parts of what we're trying to accomplish here. And that is to help you in your anti-racism work by paying attention to your values and by taking action that's aligned with those values. Jonathan and I are gonna now walk everybody through an exercise um, and Jonathan is going to um, put up a whiteboard and we're gonna walk you through an exercise that's focused on values and action. And that is based on what we've heard from Evelyn. Um, so as Jonathan draws um, I will try to explain what you're looking at. This is um it's really just a simple two by two matrix. And there are two dimensions, one is vertical and one is horizontal. And the vertical dimension, uh, which you'll see in a moment, invites you to pay attention to the difference between um, things that you experience inside your skin and things that are visible in the world. So I can have a lot of thoughts and feelings, uh, memories, impulses, and those are private experiences. And then the things that I do and say out loud, those are the visible experiences. And in the center of this matrix, you will see the word mindfulness. And what we're talking about here is we're inviting you to reflect on your values and your experiences, your private events and your observable behaviors with an attitude of noticing without judgment. To be willing to, to notice, and we're gonna invite you to speak them uh, in the chat. The, the things that you think and the things that you feel inclined to do and say. And without judging yourself, because if you judge yourself, you're gonna shut down. So this is building on the awareness and willingness that we talked about before. Uh, the horizontal dimension refers to things that we do that move us toward what we most value, what matters most to us, and things that take us away from what matters most to us, from being the people that we really want to be. So as you reflect on what you've heard from Evelyn, and what you've heard from Carl and from Patrice 
and what you've experienced going through these exercises, I want to invite you, and I particularly am hoping to hear from some of the white attorneys. Um, I'm not trying to shut out the voices of attorneys of color, but I wanna make sure we hear from the white attorneys as well. Um, and um, since we have one white attorney in our group, I'm gonna ask you, Jay, to be an active participant. I want you to think about, in response to all you've heard and what's going on in the world today, and those percentages that you saw not changing in the profession after all these years of work, what's important to you? You know, values are not goals. Values are like our North Star our North Stars. They're the things that guide us. So how does what you've heard and this moment in time relate to what matters most to you in your life, to your, your sense of purpose in your life? What do you most value? What's most important to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. It, as I look at the statistics, and I know you've cautioned us not to internalize our feelings, but it's hard not to feel frustrated seeing the, the statistic of, of uh, uh, Black lawyers having not changed in 10 years. And as, as I look back on our country's history, and I listen to Evelyn's testimony and Patrice's testimony, it's hard for me not to feel a sense of shame, not necessarily personal shame, but shame for the white man, for the white lawyer who has perpetrate, perpetrated these injustices on Evelyn and on Patrice and on a whole host of so many others. Um, I, I was in a meeting yesterday and Someone said something that I found to be very profound. Uh, and, and it was a very simple statement. He, sa he said, you know, the, the problem of racism affects black people, but it's a problem that only the white race can solve. It's our problem. It's not their problem. It's a, it's a white person's problem. And hopefully with programs like this summit and with the expert guidance that you and Jonathan and Carl have provided today, uh, this can be a springboard for more programs like this to help enlighten old white guys like me. So Jay, what are the values from which you are speaking? Why do you want to be enlightened? Why do you want to do something? What matters to you? Humanity matters. Treating, knowing that all people are, are equal and can be treated with dignity and with, and with respect. And have the same opportunities. Um, you know, I, I heard another feeling from you, and that was frustration. And it's, it sounds like another thing that you value, and I'm reading between the lines here, so tell me if um, I'm not reading right, is that um, you value uh, making change in the world. Yes. Ha things have to change. Mm -hmm. Now more than ever, our, we are as a country so polarized. 
and so, so mistakenly polarized. Everything gets politicized, everything. I know that um, a value that I have that guides me in this work is I have a very strong sense of justice. Um, justice is um, not embedded in the world. The world is random, but we can create justice in the world. Um, and uh, I guess another thing that, that, that I value that kind of guides me is um, I, I can't stand seeing people being hurt. Um, and so I, I want to address the hurts that I see and the hurts that I don't see. Um, Tracy Baker is saying fairness, fundamental fairness is a value. And so I'm, I'm gonna ask everybody to think about the, the kinds of hooks, the kinds of obstacles, the psychological obstacles that Jonathan walked us through. Um, think about what are the kinds of internal private experiences thoughts, um, memories, fears that get in the way of behaving in a way that's aligned with your values. I, I know that I've heard a lot today about fear, um, that there's fear about speaking up understandable fear. Um, Mary Catherine Roper is saying that her value is accepting responsibility for fixing the world. Um, I, I know defensiveness, um, less so now that I've been doing this work, but I know I can remember myself many, many years ago um, before I really took a hard look at what it meant to me to, to me to be white, that I thought of myself as a fair and just person. And when I was confronted with the fact that that's not the way I was living, I felt defensive. Um, Lori is talking about fear of retaliation for speaking up. What, what else gets in the way? If, if you reflect, Jay, on your own experience, what kinds of thoughts and feelings have an, an internal, any kind of internal experience that's gotten in the way of you um, making change in the world? You know, you've talked before about the anxiety that, that white people often feel uh, about discussing racial issues. And I've felt that anxiety. I've felt that anxiety walking into uh, a minority bar committee meeting where, you know, I may be uh, one of a handful of white faces. Uh, I, I feel that anxiety um, communicating with, with other black lawyers, feeling like, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not adept enough at avoiding 
the kind of microaggressions, Ellen, that you you and Jonathan have mentioned earlier, and I'm so fearful of hurting someone's feelings that my anxiety will prevent me from uh, expressing myself. And, and, I, and so I have, I feel like I have so much more to learn to, to control that anxiety and to avoid um, what, what may be perceived as microaggressions. And um, I certainly empathize with that. Um, even in my interactions with Evelyn and Patrice, I'm so aware of my fear of being hurtful. Um, other feelings that, um, here's a thought that comes up from Nancy, Jonathan. Um, feeling like I, ha I don't have a place in this discussion. Um, that's a, a, a thought that Nancy has that gets in the way. And um, and I, I'm, I'm also seeing um, fatigue exhaustion and anger. And um, I really appreciate your architectural skills here, Jonathan. So uh, as Jonathan is writing these, um, going to ask you, when you do get hooked by these experiences, you know, when you're thinking, I don't have a place in this discussion, when you're thinking, I'm afraid of being ostracized, discounted, um, I'm, I'm just preaching to the choir, why bother? Um, when you're feeling afraid and overwhelmed, fearful of retaliation, when you're feeling just too exhausted, what do these hooks lead you to do next? So we're, we're talking here about the kind of automatic behaviors <clears throat> that we engage in that are not necessarily aligned with our values. And that, that come from all those feelings and thoughts that we've been talking about. Um, so, one, one person has shared, I blurred out the first thought in my head. Um, I know that um, I, I've shared this story before that um, I can remember a time when uh, I was hooked by stereotypes of black men being dangerous and avoided, avoided going into neighborhoods, avoided groups of people on the street. And, and I certainly say that with shame, but I know I have avoided. Um, I'm, I've heard from the testimonies of avoiding bringing my whole self, letting people know who I am. Um, I've avoided speaking up. Jay, when you get hooked by your thoughts and, 
and feelings and fears. How have you acted? What, ha what have you done or not done that was not aligned with your values? Uh, I think I practiced avoidance. And when, when my anxiety overtakes me, I, I avoid. Mm -hmm. um, I think I've gotten hooked by, um, and again, this is not in my recent past, but I, I remember with guilt getting hooked by noticing stereotypic features of somebody's face. And then I have not individuated somebody. And I don't think I ever called two people by the same name, but I'm sure I got close to doing it. What other kinds of things have, have people done when you think about the, the feelings and, and memories and emotions that hook you and move you away? Well, I'll, I'll try to answer, Ellen. One of, one of the things that I've done that has proven to be a, a little productive is I've started the, um, the ABA 21-day program. Um, I forget what it's called, but it's a, a whole curriculum of, of readings and articles and videos. Um, I try to do one a day, although I haven't been uh, completely on schedule. About halfway through it. So and, I, um, I, I'm going to um, ask Jonathan to put that in the top right, which are the actions that we can take if we are being mindful of our values. So even while we're feeling those feelings and thinking those thoughts, mm -hmm. even with our fears and our defensiveness and our discomfort. Um, you're saying that one of the things that you're doing that's aligned with your values is to engage with that 21 day racial equity habit building challenge that the ABA has provided. Um, I, I see journaling and I think that is doing active work that's aligned with values. It's a way to be mindful of your anger so that when it comes to taking action, you're taking mindful action. You're doing what you think will work. Um, again, if you think about what you heard from Evelyn and from Patrice, and you think about those values of humanity, dignity, and respect, fairness, creating justice, accepting responsibility, then what might you do? What would you do if you were being the person that you want to be? Um, so I see uh, challenging, I assume that's challenging, um, 
racist actions um, or speech. Um, I see reaching out to people and asking questions to learn. Um, I see confronting racist behaviors by white individuals every time, not just when it feels safe. <clears throat> I think you're all taking action by attending this program. Um, I, I see um, educating yourself and educating others. I know that for me, um, one of the actions is Oh, vote. Yes, wonderful, vote. Um, one, one of the actions that I take with mindfulness is to be willing to make a mistake um, because I know that um, I have racism baked into my bones, just like all of us. And no matter how much I try, I'm gonna make mistakes and I invite people to call me out on those mistakes. And no matter how defensive I might feel, um, I'm gonna listen and change my behavior. Um, Jonathan is writing about his commitment to long-term policy change efforts. Um, Lauren is saying, I take the time to have difficult conversations. And I make sure that I don't let racism have a place in my life. A and Pamela is saying, displaying basic civility and demonstrating professional courtesy I want to thank you all um, and encourage you all to look at the chat because there have been so many wonderful contributions here. Um, Nancy Walsh is saying, make building genuine relationships with people who are different from me a foundation of my life. Even the most conflict avoidant among us can't ignore injustice directed at someone we truly know and love. Nancy, that's so well said. Mentoring minorities, holding their hands, not just in name, but actually investing and believing in them. Jay, I think what you said really demonstrates what aligning your behavior, your actions with your values can look like. Um, to be willing to look at yourself, to be willing to learn, to be willing to share this experience It, that's a pretty gutsy thing to do, um, to be willing to serve as a model, um, to be willing to show up for Black Lives Matter, to be willing to um, make mistakes. I've seen you make mistakes and, um, and you've been so open to feedback. You have not let defensiveness hook you. 
so given how little time we have left, um, I want to bring everybody's attention to two um, documents in your materials. Uh, one is called uh, Developing Skills to Become an Ally, Awareness, Willingness, Values, and Action, Menu of Committed Action Steps. If there was time, we would sort you into breakout rooms to have you talk over these actions. Um, but instead, what we're going to do is to ask you first to read those committed action steps. And we hope you do talk to your colleagues about these. It's not an exhaustive list. So feel free to um, add to the list. We've divided them up into three categories. Work you can do uh, personally, um, like the kinds of things that Jay has talked about, taking the ABA's 21 day diversity challenge. A second category is to reach out and engage with people who are different from you. Join a diverse bar association and attend the meetings. Going to the National Bar Association meeting was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. I learned so much about myself and I met so many amazing people. And the experience of being the only white person in the room is an important experience to have. And then if you happen to be in a leadership position in your organization, um, whether it's a law firm or a, a corporate legal department, take a look at the action steps that we're suggesting that you might implement. They are all possible. They are all doable. Nothing here is beyond your reach. And then after you've gone through this list, we're going to ask you to do something else, something that is not very typical. You have a document that says developing skills to become an ally, awareness, willingness, values, and action, action pledge. And Jay and the uh, Pennsylvania Bar Association and the Montgomery County Bar Association are asking you to complete this pledge form. It invites you to make a commitment based on your values about how you will interact differently the next time you interact with someone who is different from you. We ask you to make a commitment to taking an action step, a specific action step to make the bar more equitable and to decide by when you will complete that and to invite a colleague to hold you accountable because what we know about the difference between thoughts and actions is that, uh, and I'm sure you've experienced this on New Year's Eve many times, that we can make resolutions, but unless we hold ourselves accountable to other people, we don't take them. And to think about the value that is uh, motivating you to take this action step. But we're asking you to do something more than this. We're asking you to sign it, to date it, and to send your pledge to Susan Wolf at the Pennsylvania Bar. And 
the bar will post your commitments on its website, not to shame you, not to um, embarrass you in any way, but as a statement of what you as members of this bar are willing to do to move the needle. Um, when you submit your committed action and it is posted, you will be an inspiration to others in the bar. You'll know you're not doing this alone. And then when you complete your committed action, you'll also let the bar know and, that, and the whole bar will celebrate that. Because what is needed now is not talk. We've been talking for too many years. That's why Carl is so exhausted. That's why so many of you are so exhausted. What we need now is action. And we're counting on you to take those committed action steps because of the values that you've shared. I wanna thank all of my colleagues for being so courageous, for inspiring us. Um, I let Jonathan speak for himself, but I will, I know that I can say that this has been the most deeply moving experience that I have ever had in doing this work. Um, my, my friendships with Evelyn and Patrice are just an amazing benefit uh, that um, I've been so privileged. <laughs> and, uh, um, and I'm gonna start to cry. So Jonathan, would you like to say some final words and Carl, and Jay, before we end, I'll say I'll say two sentences and then pass it on for sake of time. Number one, Ellen emphasizes action. That was the point of our work today to try to give you a path forward, a path a path through the obstacles, such that you can take action. But not just action based on the urge of the moment, but sustained action for the next month the next year, the next decade, sustained action over and over again. Um, I want to also thank the team for the experience and for the opportunity to do this with all of you and I'll let others have the final word. Thank you all very much. And before others have the final word, just in response to the chat, I know I hear you saying you need resilience training if you're gonna sustain this over time. And I would invite you to reach out to Jonathan and myself because we're both psychologists and we know a lot about resilience and we're happy to support your efforts there. Carl and Jay. I just wanna read a little something that I picked up a long time ago. Be careful of your thoughts, they may become words. Be careful of your words, they may become actions. Be careful of your actions, they may become habits. Be care careful of your habits, they may become character. And be careful of your character, it becomes your destiny. And hopefully your thoughts will end up in your destiny of taking action. And I'd like to thank everyone also for agreeing to go on this journey with me. Thank you again. Thank you, Carl, for saying yes when I called you. And, and thank you, Ellen and Jonathan, for putting together just such a, a moving program. I've been sort of shivering here in my office, not because it's cold, but because it's just has been such an emotional two and a half hours. And that emotion has built over the last nine months while we planned this event. Uh, it, it has been everything that I had hoped it to be. And I thank you and Jonathan and Carl, but mostly I thank Patrice and um, 
Evelyn for showing the courage that all of us need to be able to find somewhere within us to exhibit and share. And thank you all for hanging in there with us. Okay, I think uh, that wraps up our first session. Uh, this is Andrea Farney back with you. We're now going to move into our first break and we will begin again at 1130. So if you could please uh, come back and we'll look forward to engaging in more work with you. Thank you so much for that, for that session. That was truly special. <laughs>